Good evening. Welcome to the new school. My name is Karen Kooni. I'm the director of the Vera List Center for Art and Politics. And um, looking back on, I think, five years of collaborations with Sculpture Center, which brought to us a really exceptional series of artist talks, where the artists talk about their work, but they really talk about and create and develop a history of sculpture through their own work or through comments on, on the history of sculpture, what they consider sculpture. So it's um, a wonderful way to consider um, the the conditions and the history and the lineage of an artist's work through his or her eye. And I'm delighted to have another um, edition of this talk tonight with Lucy Scare. Mary Sarudi, the executive director of Sculpture Center, will now introduce the artist. And I thank you all for coming. Thank you, Karen. Thank you all for coming. Um, I want to thank the New School and Karen Kwoni in particular and Annie Shaw for hosting us here. Um, it has been a nice collaboration over the years and we're thrilled to be back with another series of three. That's going to fix itself, right? When you touch it? Okay. Um, <laughs> um, as Karen said, it's, uh, I think this is the fifth year we've done this program together and, um, and Karen sort of accurately described, the intention was to sort of further the way Sculpture Center's um, program looks at the history and legacy and the conventions of sculpture. And um, it's an opportunity for us to uh, do talks with artists who have maybe, maybe not had this kind of a venue in New York City and um, been able to talk in this context, but also to sort of get them out of the usual talk about you know, a slideshow of, you know, I made this and then I made this and then I made this, but to talk sort of about the things all around the work as much as about the work itself. So um, tonight we're going to welcome Lucy Skyer. There are three uh, lectures in this series this year. Um, on March 15th in the Teresa Lang uh, Community and Student Center, which is over on at 55 West 13th Street, um, we'll welcome Nairi Bergramian, who is coming from Berlin. Um, and then on April 9th at Sculpture Center, Josephine Mexieper will be uh, will be the final artist in the series for this year. Um, with that said, I want to introduce Lucy Skyer. She was born in Cambridge and studied at the Glasgow School of Art, and she now lives in New York City. She's, I think I'm a little high, um, working in sculpture, painting, video, film, installation, <laughs> um, and drawing, I could probably even add into that, printmaking, <laughs> um, all sorts of disciplines. She's had um, many uh, solo exhibitions, very impressive solo exhibitions, actually, at the Fruit Market Gallery in Edinburgh, uh, Konsthalle Basel in Basel, Switzerland, and the Chisholm Gallery in London. Um, she's been included in numerous group exhibitions, um, uh, like major international exhibitions such as the 52nd Venice Biennale, the 5th Berlin Biennial, and uh, in recent group exhibitions at the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, the Central Pompidou, and K21 in Dusseldorf. She was a Turner Prize finalist in 2009, and you can currently see her work in a two-person show at Sculpture Center with David Malkovich called Scene Hold Ballast, and uh, her solo show, Harlequin is as Harlequin does, opened at Murray Guy uh, last week. And if you, you want to do the full tour of Lucy Skyer in New York at the moment, um, a film that she made in collaboration with Les Rosalind Nasashibi is uh, on view at the Met. It's part of their collection. It's called Flash in the Metropolitan, and it's in an exhibition titled Spies in the House of Art. With that, I will turn the podium to Lucy. Um, thanks, Mary, for the introduction, and thanks to Viralist for having me. Also, thanks to Isla Levy-Yap for um, helping me put this talk together. Okay, um, as this is not a straight artist talk, um, I've made it more of a kind of tour through um, examples of medieval imagery, early printing, poetry, writing, anecdote, and strategy that have influenced the way that I look at and make sculpture. 
Um, throughout my practice, I've been interested in examining this, the character of, sorry, the character appearance and what a shift between two, three, and four dimensions might look like. And if this movement from one state to another can itself be represented. Although I work across different media, including sculpture, drawing, film, <laughs> as Mary said, jack of all trades, um, my central interest is in the embodiment of a reference or moment and how close a representation can come to its original in terms of attitude or behavior. I'm drawn to things that appear oddly, um, that appear to behave oddly when represented, things that seem to carry on an existence in our own dimension. An example of this is Holbein's Dead Christ in His Tomb from 1522, in which the stillness of the cadaver remains active and current. This um, painting was in the museum in Basel, it still is, but um, I spent a lot of time when I was on residency there looking at it and um, seeing how it behaves. And when you actually get close to it, it seems like a kind of morphing happens where the features of the face of Christ kind of switch around with each other and um, almost it becomes kind of undone as a human figure. Um, The, the painting seems to kind of inhabit the same time as the viewer. And I think it's because the potential for movement of the body in the painting is integral to the allegory of the painting and also for the image to possibly kind of transcend its status. We wait to see if it moves as we're looking at it. I think that sculpture has this quality of continuing in our own time and existing in our space. This makes it a medium for transformation rather than translation. Traditionally, figurative sculpture is sought to breathe life into inert material. A full extension of this logic is played out in the Pygmalion myth. I'm interested in the converse phenomenon, however, a drain of life from the material to leave a calcified blank version in which the matter becomes primary and paradoxical. It's a short extract from Shakespeare's The Tempest that I'm sure you all know. Full fathom five, thy father lies. Of his bones a coral made. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. Jean Baudrillard states that the object stands for our own death, symbolically transcended. We reach an accommodation with the anguish-laden fact of lack of literal death. We will continue to enact this mourning for our own person through the intercession of objects, and this allows us, albeit regressively, to live out our lives. This is a um, medieval tomb sculpture called a transy tomb. Um, it's a style of medieval grave in which the body of the dead is carved as in life at the top with the attributes of status and occupation with the lower version of the same body in a state of composition, in a state of decomposition, sorry, complete with worms and hanging flesh in some examples. Um, below this still and out of view lies the actual body reduced to bones or perhaps to dust. The tomb can be read from top to bottom the diminishment of the person from recent death through the transitional macabre decomposition to the actual remains, or from the bottom to the top, from the corpse to the enduring object of the person as it, as it was in life. Either way, the transitional rotted in-between state activates. It allows the tomb to have a multiple relationship to time and to span a time period. Funerary monuments such as these may recall Maurice Blanchot's description of the cadaver as its own image. It no longer entertains any relation with this world, 
where it still appears, except that of an image, an obscure possibility, a shadow ever present behind the living form, which now, far from separating itself from this form, transforms it entirely into shadow. It is likeness, like to an absolute degree, overwhelming and marvelous, but what is it like? Nothing. This is a sculpture um, in Marfa that I saw um, when I went there two years ago um, by Ronnie Horn called Things That Happen Again. Um, it's an installation in which the viewer encounters the same form twice. The repetition of the shape in all its detail <coughs> makes the viewer aware of the process of recognition, having freshly remembered the experience to almost re overlap with its re-encounter. Walking from one end of the room to the other, impressions form and recede from the present, like looking into aligned mirrors. The installation brackets time like the transi tomb, but the time exists within the viewer as our own accreting history. We become and enact the transitional element. This is a work of my own um, called The Siege, and it's based on the um, idea of a siege being um, a space that has, well, a kind of scenario that has um, matter kind of posited against time. So there's a direct relationship between how long the siege can continue with how much material is present. Um, so this is a wall bisecting the space. And this is what you come round the side to, to inhabit. Um, I wanted the, the work to have a kind of feeling of entering a freeze frame. So um, as you walk among things, it feels almost like walking inside a black and white photograph. Um, within the installation, I placed a number of tables which are carved with um, a zero, which is then printed from. Um, I wanted the zero to be a kind of um, countdown to a moment of crisis or a kind of end, like a zero hour, zero minute. Here, the, langu the language is not allowed to detach from the thing it seeks to describe, but rather teeters at the point of severance extending the moment both of production and reception, the print and, and the block. I want to turn now to the detachment of the image from three to two dimensions, and conversely, the return from the graphic to the three dimension. In my work, I'm really often crossing this, um, this boundary between two and three dimensions, making drawings that are, um, have a kind of unusual weightiness or mass, or kind of conversely dragging something from the graphic into the three dimensional. This is a painting by Lucas Cranach. Um, it's of uh, melancholy, the allegory of melancholy, in which the cupids are pictured playing a kind of absorbing game. The viewer is party to the scene of cherubs maneuvering a sphere through a hoop while melancholy looks on and whittles a stick, presumably to be made into another hoop. I see a line, a hoop, a sphere, like graphics across the panel. They are tethered to the language of the painting by their inclusion as a subset, a game governed by its own rules, a retreat from the outside language. The game's insular and self-referential. 
It absorbs the players so intently that they, and even the dog, are unaware of a battle which is taking place outside their window, the approach of an ominous cloud of witches. There is an addition of a dimension from stick to hoop and again to sphere, like an idea becoming flesh or vice versa, a representation being made. The hoop and the sphere are symbolic of renewal of cyclical events. In Cranach's paintings, the renewal seems to be more about the continuity of the game and of swaths of time passing rather than a productive seasonal cycle. The cherubs aimlessly play with these symbols milling about like ideas that shift idly from one form to another form. Meanwhile, the focus of the painting is on the sphere, the point where the symbolic comes closest to the dimensions of the painted depth. Dura's representation of melancholy also depicts a strange solid form. The polyhedron at the center of the left to at the center left of the etching. It appears as an enigma for its own sake, rather than a recognizable element of an otherwise legible allegory. This form has led to much speculation and has been variously interpreted as an embodiment of geometry, a crystal found where Dura grew up, a stone vomited by Saturn, or as, appears at the bottom, as it appears at the bottom of a seven-runged ladder, it's interpreted as lead, the lowest of the seven step progressions of the metal in alchemy from lead to gold. This object has caused so much debate on its own, it has its own Wikipedia page under Dura's solid, and mathemat mathematicians have worked out its proportions. It can be described mathematically as follows. Dura's etching also features various discarded scientific measuring devices and practical tools, which do not appear to provide inspiration or resolution. His image has been linked to alchemical symbolism, as well as the moment of artistic inspiration. The alchemical goal was not only to turn a base metal into gold, but also to find the elixir of life and so become immortal. See that the hourglass with the sand running through. Looking at the solid, which I've drawn here, um, it seems to me to be an equivalent to Melancholia herself, as the relationship between the two is an echo of the balancing scales in the center. So, see the, the scales up there at the top seem to mirror this relationship here and also there's another axis running through between the this stone and the dog and the, um, yeah. Perhaps the faint face that appears in the widest pane of the polyhedron is not a skull, as has been frequently interpreted, but rather a reflection of the face of melancholy. Both she and the polyhedron are untransformed. The millstone is also a, the equivalent of the curved, curved dog below it. There's a certain blankness or dumb challenge in the polyhedron, and this is early blueprint for an abstract sculpture. Sorry, and this early blueprint for an abs abstract sculpture seems to pose a question in its inert weightiness. Giacometti made this sculpture, titled Cube, based on Dura's solid. It's hard to know in what way Giacometti's sculpture is abstract. Is it still equivalent or representational, or should it now be understood literally, referring to nothing beyond itself? In which system should it be read? The object is translated in becoming material, and it's stranded from its melancholic allegory. It's a graphic return to the material world as enigma. The object is transcendent and base at the same time. The return of matter 
crossing back from the image realm into our own is a tactic that I've used in my work and always to pose a problem or arrive at a crisis of interpretation. I see this state of matter, I see the state of this matter in a relationship similar to that that the zombie has to the cadaver. In Lars Bang Larsen's essay, The Zombies of Immaterial Labor, The Modern Monster and the Death of Death, he, undescri he describes the zombie thus. Undead and abject, the zombie is uncontrollable ambiguity. Slouching across the earth, restlessly but with hallucinatory slowness, it is a thing with a soul, a body that is rotten but reactive, oblivious to itself, yet driven by an unforgiving instinct. It follows that if the zombie is defined by ambiguity, it cannot be reduced to a negative presence. In fact, it could be a friend. This is a painting by British surrealist artist Paul Nash, whose work's been really important to me. Um, I've referred to a a few of his paintings directly in works of my own. Um, one in the siege, actually, I, I um, took a screen that he'd painted in one of his paintings and um, made a wooden version of it, complete with the kind of um, anomalies that you might get if you quickly painted something. And with quite expressive brush strokes, I made all of those errors of, in geometry in a kind of wooden structure. Um, and also, uh, I made a film of one of his paintings called Flight of the Magnolia um, with Rosalind Nashashibi, where we kind of took the nature of the painting, which is a kind of unfolding of an event, and made a film from it, kind of playing with the stillness of the image and the feeling that it has of being an event taking place. But um, here, in this painting... Um, which is called Equivalence for the Megaliths. Um, I think that Nash is proposing something quite um, radical in that he has um, inserted his kind of geometric cylinders and planes in the same space as, as um, kind of ancient megaliths. And there's a way that he's proposing that these shapes can take the context, but also the role of these mystical and ancient objects that we actually don't know much about. I think this kind of idea of a open channel to the past, a mixing of modernity with ancientness is something that's really interesting. It's also a kind of sleight of hand that um, that you might be able to propose that these things um, occupy the same, same role. To close this section on detachment of the image and return to three dimensions, I'd like to read a short text by Paul Nash called The Nest of Wild Stones. Nash talks here of transformation not of material itself, but of his attitude towards it. The text nest, nest of Wild Stones is quite unusual and hard to find, so I'll read it in its entirety, um, if you'll <laughs> bear with me. It's about three minutes long. I found my first nest of wild stones on looking closely into a drawing I had just made of some bleached objects on the Swanage Downs. It lay just below the level of my consciousness, slightly out of focus. But there was no mistaking its lineaments a moment later when I moved the dry thoughts to one side. I do not think that ideas which come to us from wherever they come should be submitted to analysis 
except where there's every reason for or every reason against, supposing that by peeling off the bark, we can get better at the bite. The bite is better than the bark, which is worse than the bite. Or, like stripping a woman to discover the woman underneath. But if I broke all of the shells of my wild stones, I should find that precious yolk which is like precious stones, the black core of the flint. If stones are eggs, they are birds too. Not even grosbeaks, always, or comic birds like toucans, but partridges and land rails much more, and pretty little quails, larks even. All birds of the furrow and the down. Sculptors knock birds out of stones, but by the time they have done with them, they are neither birds nor stones, except brancusis. But the stone birds of the field are always both. They do not insist. Perhaps when they are lying on the ground, they are stones, and when they stand up, they are birds. But, thank God, they never look like stone birds. Sometimes one may find a pair almost side by side, inseparable complements in true relation. Yet, lying there in the grass, never finding each other, until I found them that afternoon on the Sussex Downs during an attempt to remember whether Edward, Edward James lived in East or West Dean. The pro that problem was not then solved. But so soon as my stones came into my hands, their equation was solved and they were united forever. And directly Edward James saw the picture of these two, he wished to acquire it. But it is only at this moment that I have recalled that these stones came from the Downs of West, or was it East Dean? So life runs on, not cut and dried like some horrible tobacco the Padre smoked, or locked away in an abstract like, an amber, like a fly in amber, but flowing backwards and forwards throughout, a complex maze of associations which keep the mind guessing and the imagination hovering like that gay summer monster which suggests a nightmare trim trinity, the elephant hawk moth with his inveterate tongue. Let us kill two birds with one stone, one the egg, one the bird. They are not dead, but sleeping, imprisoned in the stone like those truffles in aspic I once bought in the Nice market under Matisse's window. But Matisse keeps all his birds in a great cage, canaries mostly. He seemed to dote upon them, but he never puts them into his pictures, so far as I know. There is a difference between real and surreal birds, of course. But somewhere in between must come my stepmother's canary, which has a forked tail like a kite or a puttock. I have had the honor of drawing this bird now for perhaps 15 years. When I last drew him, I noticed that he had got into the sky. His cage depended from a, from a cirrus cloud. Below, a dark sun suffused the upper air with roseate film. The cage seemed rather to fly than to be hanging there. With its crisscross slender bars and perches, it looked like a kite. And then the other day, I heard that the bird had gone blind. Poor bird, he cannot see the sun. It does not matter now, I suppose, that he is in the sky. How he is, how, how is he different now from the imprisoned birds within the stones? They are not dead, but sleeping. He is not dead, but he is blind. Snarers put out the eyes of birds to make them sing. Bullfinches, goldfinches, and larks. I found a stone upon the downs like a blind lark a thing choking with that song that dared not fly, but seemed to strain upwards, always. I will make an ivory hand I have fling the stone into the sky where it may sing until it dies and falls down into the furrow. People say, why do you paint these things? Why are you not content with things as they are, applying them to painting as understood? All nature as it is 
seems better so than any in imitation of it, than an impression of it, or a post-impression, after all. But we may take the elements of nature and make what we choose, without reference to existing law and order, or even painting as understood. That seems worth doing. An in result often looks le less like a second helping of the English Sunday dinner than does our heritage in the English tradition as understood. I have taken the elements that go to make my nest of wild stones, earth, air, and hard, cold stone. But of the nest itself, what is there to tell? My first looked like a sheet of squared paper with a torn edge, stretched across a barren field. The next, an earthen basin in the hills. But when the authors of Axis and I flushed a covey of wild stones on east or west Ilsley Down, I found a stone nest bearing the imprint of its only egg. It was a rare find. But some months later, I inherited a small Victorian library more closely stocked with books I do not want to read than I had imagined possible, save here and there a treasure. One such bore the titles Homes Without Hands. I make a present of it, suitably translated to Giacometti. It is a book illustrated at the height of the engraver's skill about the nests of animals. The mole, the weasel, the polar bear, the dreadful aardvark, and the malangong, the puffin, the mutton bird, the bee-eater, the gribble and its kin, the purple grackle and the robber crab, the piddock and the shipworm, the scorpion and the bird spider, the eucera and the scolia, the philanthus and the bembex, the ant lion and the terrifying termites. Nests of a dreadful beauty, under the earth, beneath the sea, pensile nests, nests which change the face of landscapes, parasitic nests, the plight of the poor puss moth and the horrid evidence of galls. A new world was unfolding. Without hands, I began to build. I forgot my nest of wild stones. Blankness is a state that I'm interested in and a tactic that I've used in my work. It is the removal of some but not all aspects of a, of a thing. For example, the, movement, the, sorry, the removal of content but not structure, the removal of form but not matter, or the removal of comprehension, comprehension from a scene. This image is from Balatar's film, The Reckmeister Harmonies, from 2000. The film presents a story in which a whale carcass comes to town as part of a carnival. The whale can only be seen inside the trailer, affording only a coexistent glimpse at the whale, never an overview of the whole. And actually, this film was mentioned to me um, when I made... A, a sculpture myself of a whale skeleton that was completely enclosed in walls so that you could only see very small, through the gaps in the walls, very small glimpses of the whale. And um, this is kind of strange parallel. This moment is a confrontation between the main protagonist, Janos, and the eye of the whale. Both viewpoints are compromised and hampered. The arrival of the circus in the plot of the film <coughs> and the whale carcass triggers a, tr triggers a decline into despondency and then ship it, slip into chaos of the townsfolk. There's an impenetrable quality to the animal eye, a kind of window onto a missing soul. The animal eye looks back with a gaze that sees but does not comprehend. I've used the animal eye as an external angle in several of my installations 
to introduce the presence of a kind of exterior, a viewpoint beyond the rational that is suggested, but that can't be shared. Here I wanted to present a parallel blank blankness, the blank of a stare, but also the blank of, of form, which you see in the white shape. The form's been made by um, cutting into the film frame with a um, ticket conductor's punch. So I collected a lot of these um, different shaped punches, and I was interested in the way that um, they have this kind of arbitrary, um, abstract nature. They just functionally need to be different from one another. But the shapes that they actually are um, don't usually represent anything um, and are quite idiosyncratic like this one. But when you buy them on eBay, um, people attribute what they are to them. So. Um, I've got a few kind of Mickey Mouse or um, different birds, or and it's quite hard to see how someone's read that into it, but they have. Um, the the installation that I made with these called Rachel, Peter, Caitlin, John. Um, I use the hole punch to um, interrupt and um, create a kind of stutter in the film so that the, um, the movement of the image is kind of dissected by this um, punching of the film. The blank is also something that's not yet made, um, like a blank, blank stone or a tablet that's not yet inscribed. Or like a Scrabble tile, something that become, can become any other thing, something that doesn't act in the normal rules. This is um, the Federal Gold Reserve here, um, where I went. You can actually go on a tour of it. And I did that when I first moved here in 2005. And it kind of sparked off this um, interest in making a project there where I basically want to take some of the gold bullion and um, melt it down and cast it into objects such as a kind of glass or um, a chair or kind of day-to-day -day things. Um, I'm interested in... in a removal of this blankness that the gold seems to have and how that might affect this kind of um, wall of kind of power that it <laughs> seems to exude. There's a finite of, amount of gold extracted by man thus far. This, extract, this amount extracted is estimated as a cube 82 feet long on each side. It's also likely that most gold now held in ingot form has previously inhabited different shapes, jewelry, teeth, artifacts, which have been melted down to form an ingot of standard size and weight, designed that it may be more conveniently exchanged. The Bretton Woods system of monetary management ended on August 15th, 1971, when President Nixon ended trading of gold at the fixed price of $35 per ounce. At that point, and for the first time in history, formal links between major world currencies and real commodities were severed. On a trip to the Federal Gold Reserve on the tour, I was told that when transactions take place between account holders, the gold held in the vault is no longer physically moved from one account holder to another. They each have wire cages and the gold is kind of supposed to be um, put into barrows and literally carted from one place to the other. And the guys who um, supposedly do it have these uh, enormous um, um, reinforced shoes because each ingot of gold is so heavy and they have to protect their feet. Um, 
the gold itself at the Federal Gold Reserve is so heavy that the vault had to be dug down to the Manhattan bedrock to prevent the whole building subsiding. There's also a, um, um, a sniper's alley in the building where they, um, they train marksmen to keep a kind of perfect um, shot so that they can better protect this, this gold. So the gold itself has all of this kind of elaborate um, protection and things kind of in orbit of it. I'm interested, like the, the conductor's punch, in um, the ingots, which are an essentially kind of um, arbitrary abstraction. They don't need to be any shape. Um, they conveniently stack, or they're um, of a useful unit for exchange. But they can be characterized as something that's in an in-between nature a substance in an un unfinished state suitable for transformation. This is a work I made last year called Fool's Ingots, where it's basically um, minor modifications made to improve the ingots, a kind of um, playing out of a misunderstanding of what they are. The term ballast is another stage in, in the form of arbitrariness. It could be any matter that, has a func that, is a, that is a functional dead weight. It has a kind of agency, but nothing else. It's the opposite of an image in many ways. In this installation called the good ship blank and ballast, the blankness of the material and the blankness of an uncomprehending stare are brought together. Using the allegory of the Ship of Fools from Sebastian Brandt's Das Narrenschiff, in which a boat full of fools set sails to find a utopian land, a fool's paradise called Narragonia. Taking and replicating Brancusi's sculpture, The Newborn, the sculpture itself becomes a unit, close in feel to an ingot or a cobble. The newborn itself is a sculpture that, for me, tips between matter and representation, alternating between the closeness of an egg and the open cry of the mouth. So in, in this um, installation, I, I um, carved the image that you see at the end there, which is the Ship of Falls, it's a woodcut printed um, directly from the floor. So the actual block is carved into the museum's floor um, and is situated kind of over here in the space. Like the blank Scrabble tile, the Joker in the pack op operates with exceptional rules. In 2006, I went to Mexico City to visit the surreal artist Leonora Carrington, and I made a short film as a record of our meeting titled Leonora the Joker. It's very short. I used the presence of Carrington via the film in an installation um, that I made in 2006 um, in which I tried to sidestep and unpick the logic of my previous work but without um, 
departing completely into the unknown. It's, it's very difficult for me to work um, without reference to other images or other things, I find. So um, I use the presence of, of Carrington, who had um, strong links with the surrealists. She had an affair with Max Ernst and knew a lot of um, the surrealists, such as uh, Breton, who she actually hated. And um, she told me that when she when he came around for dinner, she would serve oysters, and she would leave the ones for Breton on the windowsill in the sun for a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> Carrington died last year, and this past December I returned to her house in Mexico City. In repeating the journey but not the resulting meeting, I wanted to confront an exterior make the same gesture, but now have it stripped of the outcome. My photographs of the outside of Carrington's house form part of my current show at Murray Guy, Harlequin is as Harlequin does. This is her, her door. Um, and in these um, photographs of her house, I've screen printed on top, so there's a kind of other register, a non-photographic register that sometimes introduces a kind of blankness to the, to the image and sometimes um, overlays a pattern. The Harlequin is both pattern and archetype. It is these two aspects that my show contrasts. One plays out over time and stretches back into history, and the other is a simultaneous view from a graphic pattern. I want to take a quick diversion to give an example of this simultaneous viewing. This is an anonymous British painting known as the Chumley Ladies from the early 17th century. It's actually most likely thought to be um, painted by a tomb sculptor, which is kind of interesting. The inscription on the painting reads, two ladies of the Chumley family who were born the same day, married the same day, and brought to bed, which means give birth, the same day. The surprise that the painter may have felt when faced with such an unlikely coincidence is expressed in the way that one's eye moves around the picture. The woman and the infants are two versions of the same thing, their position, costume, and demeanor varying only slightly in detail. It's possible to see their individuality without, sorry, it's impossible to see their individuality without forcing your eye to cross the cleft between the pillows that separates the halves of the panel and to encounter each woman in turn inset into her own surround. Indeed, to the contemporary eye, the ladies look like two frames of a film curiously inhabiting the same rather consecutive instance. They have become fixed as if the painting were enacting their coincidence. And another coincidence is that um, when I went to visit um, Leonora Carrington, she actually had a postcard of this image on her fridge, taped on her fridge, which is <laughs> really strange because the image was something that I'd been writing about at the time. In my installation, the Harlequin pattern is used to justify materials that have various different pasts. Reclaimed, sorry, reclaimed mahogany that has lain forgotten underwater for over 150 years. Redundant coins collected by my father. A family portrait from 1845. These things are all made to conform to a Harlequin pattern. It creates a kind of forced presence that is the encounter of the viewer and the plane of the exhibition. The tension I, seem to, I, I seek to achieve with this arrangement is well put in an article by Rax Media Collective called Now and Elsewhere, where the geological fissure provides a simultaneous view. Contemporaneity, contemporaneity, the sensation of being in a time together, is an ancient enigma of feeling. It is the tug we feel when our time pulls at us. 
but sometimes one has the sense of a paradox paradoxically asynchronous contemporaneity, the strange tug of more than one time and place, as if an accumulation or thickening of our attachments to different times and spaces were manifesting itself in the form of some unique geological oddity, a richly striated rock sec cross section of a rock, sometimes sharp, sometimes blurred, marked by the passage of many epochs. The Harlequin has had many incarnations. As a demon, in, as in French, Heliquin, or as Hurler, the leader of the spectral wild hunt, condemned to hunt forever. Through the Commedia dell'arte and later the Harlequinade, the Harlequin became a current comic character, a trickster and a coward, but one who maintained a wiliness and agility Just as the fool or jester of the court could offer unprecedented criticism of those in power and whose bauble and stick stood in for an underlying potential for violence, the Harlequin maintains a role of disorder and uh, sorry, the Harlequin maintains his role as disorderer of narrative and holds the potential for transformation tapping parts of the stage scenery as he passes. Here is theater historian David Mayer talking about the British actor John Rich's interpretation of Harlequin in the early 18th century. Rich gave his Harlequin the power to create stage magic in league with off-stage craftsmen who operated trick scenery. Armed with a magic sword or bat, actually a slapstick, Rich's Harlequin treated his weapon as a wand, striking the scenery to sustain the illusion of changing the setting from one locale to another. Objects, too, were transformed by Harlequin's magic. To close my talk, I'm going to, talk, I'm going to quote from um, an article by Agamben, the author of Gesture, where he talks of the, of the Harlequin. The author's gesture is attested to as a strange and incongruous presence in the work it has brought to life, in exactly the same way that, according to the theorists of the Commedia dell'arte, the Harlequin's lazo incessantly interrupts the, un the unfolding, sorry, the story unfolding on the stage and continually unravels the plot. And yet, as the lazo owes its name to the fact that, like a lace, it returns each time to retie the thread that it has loosened, the author's gesture guarantees the life of the work only through the irreducible presence of an inexpressible, sorry, an in inexpressive outer edge. Like the mime in his sil silence and the harlequin with his lazo, the author tirelessly returns to enclose himself again within the opening that he has created. And just as we seek in vain in old books that reproduce the portrait or photograph of the author as a frontispiece to decipher the reasons and the meaning of the work from the author's enigmatic features, so does his gesture he hesitate on the threshold of the work like an intractable exurge that ironically claims to hold its unavowable secret. I'm going to end there um, and open for questions. fantastic uh, talk. Could I ask you to elaborate a bit on the notion of matter when you, for instance, you brought it up a few times and spoke of 
matter that's really uh, deprived of content or where content has been drained off. And you also spoke of the fish's eye that looks from somewhere else but cannot understand or read what's happening in this world. And then you mentioned agency of material or matter. Love to know more about your thinking. Yeah. Um I suppose um, the way that I think about matter is is um, in the fact that it exists in our here and now. So it's a thing that's to do with time as well as um, to do with substance. Um, and I'm drawn to these kind of points at which matter is kind of at its most raw. But because raw matter um, and the kind of non-defined matter um, is hard to be specific about, I guess the way that I think about it is trying to come to it kind of around um, around the back almost, like um, which is why uh, I'm kind of seeking to make it show up by dragging it through allegory or dragging it through um, the image. Um, and I suppose like the, the text um, from Paul Nash that I read um, is a kind of separation of, of matter from what it might mean or matter from interpretation or rather a kind of allocation of um, interpretation to matter that isn't really dependent on what the matter is like, maybe. <laughs> um, and I think in a way, like, matter poses that problem of, of meaning or interpretation. If you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll bring you the mic. You, you work with a, a lot of mediums, and I was wondering, uh, <clears throat> are you always the maker of, or do you have fabricated and design and a lot of the time, whatever? Um, I, I um, work with actually a really good friend who I studied with, um, and he fabricates a lot of the things that I make. Um, I fabricated some of the, of the works for the Murray Guy show, but... Um, <laughs> I'm not cut out for it, you know? Oh, good. I, I feel better about myself, yeah, because I do the same thing. So. <laughs> but the drawings I, I make mostly myself, sometimes with um, assistant, but mostly myself. And the films I all shoot myself. <laughs> I, um, I really loved the the film with um, Leonora, and I was just wondering if you could, you know, just for um, the sake of it, maybe talk about some of the time you spent with her and how your, you know, how your, uh, you know, how you came to work with her and and, and your time in Mexico. Sure. Um, I um, read in a magazine actually that that uh, she was still living. Um, and it was really that fact that we were alive at the same time which made me want to visit her rather than um, an interest in her work, which isn't, doesn't sound that generous of me. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but, I mean, her work is interesting, and, and I, I read her books and, and so on before I went to, to see her. But um, I, I wrote to her. Um, I wrote her a hand written letter, which actually <laughs> I didn't write myself. <laughs> so I've got horrible handwriting. Um, so I got my friend to write it and then um, sent it to her, but she didn't get back to me. Um, so then I was coming, I was on a residency in New York, so I was coming to the end of my, of my time here and I just thought I'm never going to 
actually fly to Mexico from the UK on this kind of whim. So I'll go from New York before I have to leave um, and just hope that she'll she'll speak to me. Um, and I got her address from, from a collector in Texas who also told me that if I was going, I should bring some um, English biscuits and English tea. So, so um, I turned up and um, I went to, to her street. And her house actually looked pretty dilapidated at that time. Um, and I suddenly had this panic that, I, that she didn't live there or that... Um, that I had the wrong address or whatever. So I just went to the door and I banged on the door. Um, and it opened and Leonora opened it. And I was so kind of dumbfounded that I just said, Leonora. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and she said, what do you want from me? And this like very cold. <laughs> But anyway, then I plied her with the biscuits and the tea and I made an appointment to come and see her the next day. But we had a kind of interesting um, conversation. I, I had a kind of, I guess, naive um, idea that her being a surrealist artist, it might be more interesting the older that she got to... Um, to yeah. <laughs> um, that that she might be interested in a kind of withdrawal into herself that um, I was thinking might come with, with old age. So I was asking her about that, if she, if she felt um, that there were some kind of benefits to, to aging. Um, and she said no. She said um, that it, it just becomes harder to reconcile with, with um, one's upcoming death and that that step into the complete unknown was um, something that kind of terrified her. Um, yeah, so the film that I made, I just wanted it to be the most kind of simple um, record of our, of our meeting. It was actually the first time that I'd ever shot on film myself, so I was kind of <laughs> making it up as I went along as well. Um, but then... Um, yeah, I, I used the film as, as this kind of um, justification and a kind of animation, animating presence in this installation that I made, which was um, of quite disparate things. And it was the first time that I really um, went into a, a mode of making where I put together very um, separate things, things that usually, like the Brancusi's head and the, and the allegory of the Ship of Fools, that I brought these things falsely together. So I kind of used her, used our meeting to make that possible in my own work. Laura. I just have a question about um, the uh, notion of sincerity in your work. And uh, I mean, the um, references that you bring in and, the, and your, the way that you talk about how you make your work is with, as far as I would say, with uh, great sincerity. And I'm just curious about whether you would say that that's something you are actively aware of or you're trying to kind of... Uh, show a kind of sincere, sincere approach to history or kind of these references that you look to? Or if perhaps there is, if there's like an active um, working towards or against this idea of being sincere to kind of your own intentions or the intentions of those works which you are referencing? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting <laughs> question. Um, it's strange, like nearly all of the, of the objects that I've talked about or nearly all of the objects I've made are solid <laughs> like the Ronnie Horn one is these giant solid copper um, objects and, and minor solid copper bars or um, and the wood that I've used is reclaimed from, from these rivers in Belize where the tree trunks sunk because they were the kind of heaviest um, trees that were felled um, I think that 
I do have a kind of um, sincerity in in my work, but maybe I'm always um, kind of seeking a sleight of hand or a kind of more maverick. I'm drawn to things that are more maverick perhaps than I am. Um, and I, I've made, I mean, I've made a few projects that have been quite um, difficult to actually make happen, but would have been very easy to fake. Um, but <laughs> but I, won't, I won't do it for some reason. Um, so yeah, I think there is a, a, a sincerity, but there's also a way that um, I'm interested in the way that history is, is made. Um, and I guess these kind of departures from, from the object to the image um, is a kind of microcosm of that process. Um, but yeah, I think I am drawn to some kind of truth. It's very old fashioned. <laughs> Okay. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank